Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this Educate we Next webinar. Um, we are so excited to have Dr. Arthur Vilda again um, to present on Brugada syndrome. Um, and I know this is a really hot topic of interest, so this is going to be really fantastic, and I'm very excited. So just as a brief reminder, we like to go through our housekeeping before we start. So um, just as a reminder, some of our automatic emails may arrive to your junk email folder, so make sure you add us to known senders. And if you're attending for continuing education units, only the live session qualifies for CEUs. And attendance through the GoToWebinar link and the survey at the end of the webinar are required. If you're calling in, it does not appear on the attendance report, so you can't claim CEUs, unfortunately. Um, and so certified genetic counselors will, see, will receive 0.1 category one CEUs and one contact hour per webinar awarded at the end of the series, which is in December. So it's best to register with your personal email just in case you change jobs. So make sure you provide your NSGC user ID, not your remote ID on the survey. And if you're not an NSGC member, you have to create a guest account. If you're attending um, for uh, PACE units, there's one certificate per session available. And you have to keep track of your participa participation to verify that the CEUs earned are correct. So just some quick logistics. So you are automatically muted when you join the webinar. And this session is being recorded and this will be available on our website. So you do have a control panel that's on the right side of your screen. And from this panel, you can hide the control panel, view the webinar in full screen, and you can also ask questions. And we highly encourage you ask questions as the webinar continues and I'll be tracking those. And at the end, we will go through them. So a survey will pop up in the web browser after the presentation. And when you close the webinar window, you will get the survey. So you'll also get an email about an hour after the presentation, but you only need to complete one to claim CEU. So it won't ask for your name because you're already logged in with the name that you used on the registration, but make sure you complete the survey soon after the webinar so that you're included on the attendees report. We cannot add you after these um, few days after, so please make sure that you do this as soon as possible. And if you're calling in only, you will not receive the survey by email. You have to join through the link. So I'm so pleased to um, introduce Dr. Arthur, Arthur Vilda. Um, he's the head of the Department of Clinical and Experimental Cardiology at the University of Amsterdam Medical Center in the Netherlands. His clinical and research interests include the care of patients with arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, electrophysiology, and genetic factors contributing to sudden death. Over his career, he's published over 550 scientific papers with a major focus on the different aspects of inherited arrhythmia syndrome. In 2011, he was appointed as the member of the Dutch Academy of Science, and in 2012, he received the Heart Rhythm Society Distinguished Investigator Award. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to you, Dr. Vilda. Thank you, Margot. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And I thank uh, Ambri and uh, the SATS Foundation for inviting me for this um, intriguing topic, Brugada syndrome. So let's see. So the objectives of today are, from my side, to identify the newest studies regarding genetics and pathophysiology of Brugada syndrome, to discuss the newly developed risk scores and discuss their opportunities and limitations, and to examine to, to some extent, typical presentation, clinical treatment and management strategies. So I start with the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome because over the 20, 25 years, that has changed um, from time to time. The, the original paper, the first paper on the consensus on what the diagnosis was, was this one published in circulation in 2002. And you're looking at the precordial leads so only V1 to V6, and where the arrow is at the, in the left panel, that is what we refer to as a type one um, uh, Brugada pattern, and that is required for the diagnosis Brugada syndrome. So type two and type three in the middle and the right panel are not sufficient for the diagnosis. You really need a type one uh, uh, in, on your EKG. And then in these early days, 
the type one by itself was not sufficient. You needed uh, either a documented VF episode or a self-terminating polymorphic VT or a family history of sudden cardiac death at young age. The type one EKG in family members or being inducible at the EPS electrophysiological study or presenting with a syncope or a symptom as nocturnal agonal uh, respiration because most of the events occur at night. Now, in the years thereafter, the, uh, in 2013, the diagnosis actually changed. It became more uh, liberal. And at that point in time, the diagnosis was just the type 1 EKG uh, with or without a drug. And the drugs here means flaconite or proginamide in your country or ashmaline. <clears throat> and the type 1 could be present in any precordial lead. The latter is, is, is something that we still agree on because it turns out that the Brugada syndrome uh, relates to the substrate in the right ventricular artifact. And this is a nice paper from a German group from Mannheim where they correlate the EKG with cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging. And these are two examples. And you can see that uh, the heart at the left side is a little bit more to the left than it is at the right side. And the uh, EKG with the most positive signal at the, in panel A is the most uh, left parasternal uh, electrode, whereas when the heart shifts a bit to the uh, right side, then the sternal electrode becomes more positive. So it's clear from studies like this that the substrate of Brugada syndrome is located in the right ventricular artifact. And because people have different sizes, so now you're looking at the horizontal axis, but also in the vertical axis, some people have the positive EKG at the regular place leads in the fourth intercostal space. But if somebody is a bit uh, smaller in size, not, not as high, then the electrodes may well be positive in the third intercostal space or even in the second intercostal space. So it doesn't matter for the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome at which uh, lead it is positive. Now, in later years, this is 2016, so three years after the previous uh, consensus document, we changed it again because the, the introduction of a drug-induced EKG led to way too many diagnoses of Brugada syndrome. And we thought that was over-diagnosing. So with this group of scientists, we decided again to sit together in Shanghai. And the, the, the name of this consensus document was subsequently the Shanghai Consensus Meeting. And we now assign a kind of point system, as is also relevant in the long QT syndrome, as you might know. And in this point system, so the Shanghai score system for the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome, the spontaneous type 1 EKG provides you 3.5 points. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, then uh, that means that there is a probable or definite Brugada syndrome with 3.5 points or more. This also means that a drug-induced EKG uh, separately um, only gives you a two points. So this is a type two or three EKG pattern at baseline that converts with provocative drug testing and that gives you then two points. And in the presence of two points, you have possible Brugada syndrome, if you look at the bottom, and you need additional clinical criteria, one of the additional continuum criteria that are here in the yellow box, and then you might reach uh, the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. So this effectively means that if you have only a drug-induced Brugada EKG, that the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome cannot be made, and subsequently you should probably also not be tested for it, uh, for example, with genetics. You can do an Ashmaline test, and if the Ashmaline turns positive, then you have two points, but you need some of these other points to reach the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. So Brugada syndrome should be considered, and this is the, the Shanghai uh, document with a type 1 EKG. That in itself qualifies for Brugada syndrome. But if it is a drug-induced EKG, you need additional criteria, and these are essentially the same criteria as uh, 15 years ago in the 2002 paper. Um, then the genetic part of Brugada syndrome. There also a lot has been changed. The first gene identified was the sodium channel, SCN5A, on a short arm of chromosome 3. 
And as you know, sodium channel variants are also pertinent in progressive cardiac conduction disease and in long QT syndrome. And the ones that will uh, associate with Bogata syndrome and progressive cardiac conduction disease are loss of function variants. Now, the prevalence of these variants are, this is from early data between 2002 and 2005, it's in the range between 10 and 30 percent, and that I think hasn't changed. This is from our own uh, data. In the middle, you see Brugada syndrome in 213 uh, families. If you see when you start with a family, the yield is a little bit higher, it's up to 40 percent compared to 20 percent in an isolated case. So this is the sodium channel, and we studied a few years later, 2009, the actual role of the sodium channel um, in the Brugada syndrome. And we did so in our families together with the group in Nantes, in France. We started with 444 um, genotype Brugada syndrome probands. 118 were positive, and from these 118, we selected the families which were really large to find this with more than four family members affected. And if you then uh, subdivide these 263 family members, 115 were mutation carriers, carried the, the pathogenic SCN5A variant, and 148 were mutation negative. On the conduction intervals on the EKG, you can see that the, the loss of function of sodium channel activity because the PR interval and the QRS width are both uh, prolonged compared to the mutation negative subject. When you then subsequently look at the prevalence of the Brugada type 1 EKG, this was positive in half of the patients who were mutation positive and half of the patients who were mutation negative. Conduction intervals in these two groups were similar. But in, importantly, and, and um, maybe surprisingly, in the mutation negative subjects, there were also seven individuals with a Brugada type 1 EKG, and the conduction interval in this group is relatively normal and comparable to the Brugada syndrome negative patients. So these patients, these seven patients, are phenotype positive, genotype negative in families where an SCN5A mutation is running. These are the EKGs to show you that we really know what the Brugada pattern is. These are seven individuals with a true type 1 EKG. And once again, these patients are genotype negative and are from a family where there is an SCN5A variant, pathogenic variant found. So that raises the question, does SCN5A indeed play a role? It's important to realize that up till today, there are still no linkage data for SCN5A. Most families are not that big. Loss of function variants is apparently not mandatory, and we, you could argue that it is not the, causal, uh, the cause for the Brugada syndrome, but it's actually an important modifier. And then also note of interest is that if this would have been the first family to identify with Brugada syndrome, then SCN5A would not have been put forward as the causal gene for Brugada syndrome. Now, so Brugada syndrome was considered initially a monogenetic uh, disorder with, a, with a, a disease susceptibility based on the variant that reaches the threshold for disease. Um, and based on that, there were, in the years thereafter, many, many other genes identified, over 20 uh, different genes associated with Brugada syndrome. Uh, they have some common uh, action. All these act through uh, SCN5A, or to the sodium channel, I should say, all decrease the sodium channel. The transient outward current is affected by these five genes, calcium really, the, the calcium, L type calcium channel by these, and some other potassium channels by these. Now, then, in the time of the next gen sequencing, when the genetic testing became more extensive, this French group uh, tested the burden of rare variant variation in arrhythmia susceptibility genes in these 20 plus genes. <clears throat> and that provided indeed uh, a new insight into the molecular diagnosis for Brugada syndrome. So what they did, they had 167 Brugada syndrome cases compared to 167 controls who were over 65 year old without a cardiac history. So that's an appropriate control group. They had an internal uh, control, also 167 for these uh, individuals. And as a second control group, they used the data from the UK 10K uh, biobank. 
And then if you look at the prevalence of rare variants in these different genes, then you see that only Brugada, only SCN5A is highly prevalent in Brugada syndrome cases and much more than in the internal controls or in the UK 10K controls. And the, the rare variants are found to an equal extent in all the other genes that have been associated with Brugada syndrome, both in the internal controls as in the UK 10K controls. So that led to the conclusion that these genes are probably not all that causal to Brugada syndrome. This was more and, and again studied by the Klingen group. This is a paper from a group of scientists uh, working for, the, for Klingen. And what the, the Klingen curation process is, and in this case for Brugada syndrome, is there were three bio-curated teams from three different countries. They reviewed the Klingen gene curation SOP and the wet wave demonstration of gene curation application. Then they found the uh, different genes that had to be classified, and these genes were exposed to a, a clinical domain expert group who then made a final gene classification. And that happened for all these uh, genes, uh, associations of all these genes. Uh, you can see here the evidence level. Here are the different genes and the, um, the score of the different uh, bio-created teams. And for example, the stop one uh, did not reach uh, further than the limited status. So that is, has become the disputed gene associated with Brugada syndrome. And that holds for all these other genes. Uh, that also holds for the next page with all these genes. And on the third page, there's only SCN5A that stands out because there, there is really strong association with Brugada syndrome. But this ultimately is the only definite gene for Brugada syndrome and all the other genes are actually disputed. So that makes it a lot more easy for Brugada syndrome. There's only one gene left, SCN5A, and this has led at least in our lab to screening for Brugada syndrome is only done by screening this variant for a number of years already, so only SCN5A. This has also made it into the very latest recommendation paper that I was um, uh, lucky to chair as, the, as from the ERA side, that is the European Heart Rhythm Association, together with, for example, Betsy Kaufman as the HRS co-chair. And this was published in Europace uh, earlier this year. Uh, and this paper also deals with Brugada syndrome. These are the recommendations for Brugada syndrome. And it clearly states that only SCN5A should be screened in an index to diagnose with Brugada syndrome. And the definition that follows essentially is the Shanghai criteria that I discussed before. And we really discourage to study rare variants in genes with a disputed or refuted gene disease clinical validity that are essentially all the other genes um, associated with Brugada syndrome uh, so far. And this in the scheme, uh, it is here. So you have an index case with a type 1 Brugada syndrome or meeting the Shanghai criteria. Otherwise, then genetic counseling is obviously recommended. Sequencing of SCN5A is recommended, but not of all the other uh, genes. And then what happens is you either find a pathogenic variant or a rare variant with unknown significance, or you find no variant. And then the clinical further screening is, is uh, and, and genetic counseling is appropriate. Um, you end up with targeted sequencing if you have a found a class four or five pathogenic variant. And uh, you can use a rare variant uh, with unknown significance uh, for co-segregation analysis and maybe upgrade the variant uh, later on. <clears throat> So what then is the alternative for the genetic basis of Brugada syndrome? This was studied by our group in 2013. This was the first GWAS in Brugada syndrome. It was only on 317, uh, paid 312 patients. And this was compared to uh, over a thousand control individuals. And the bottom line of this uh, GWAS is that there were two loci identified with Brugada syndrome and one loci was in the region of chromosome three and had two peaks. And one was on chromosome six on the HEI2 the hey gene. And these three loci uh, essentially um, clearly, uh, when they aggregate together, 
and you have a much higher chance. You, this is what you see in the in kind of V here. If you have the five or six alleles, so you have all the, the, the minor alleles uh, of these three loci, then you have a 21.5 more chance of having a type one EKG than you have uh, none of them. And, and this gradually increases the more uh, alleles you accumulate. This was found in the European cohort, and there was a replication sample from Japan where a very similar distribution was found. And that essentially brings you to this model. You have a variant that can be uh, a CM5A variant, cannot be enough, just not be enough for ST elevation in V1 or V2. Patient two has a rare variant to SNP, patient three has both, and that just tips the balance into the diagnosis of a type 1 EKG. Patient four has a SNP, a rare variant, patients five and two, and patient six has all three, and all, also that then can lead to a type 1 uh, Brugada pattern uh, EKG. In a very recent uh, study uh, based on an international Brugada syndrome a genetic consortium, there were almost 3,000 Brugada syndrome patients from the countries that are here in green on the world map. And this study was performed by Julian Bark from Nantes and Rafik Tados from Montreal and Charlotte Klinge from Copenhagen. All three worked in our uh, institute as well. And they uh, did a GWAS on these almost 3,000 cases. And as you can see, there are now 12 loci with 21 independent signals. And uh, many of these signals are transcription loci, and these transcription loci actually control ion channel expression in an adult heart. And so this all relates to uh, ion channels. And if you do the same analysis as I, I mentioned before, now what you see at the bottom on the x-axis is the polygenetic risk score d -sile. So out of these 21 loci subdivided in 10 uh, B-cells, then if you have uh, many of them, you end up with a far more likely likelihood of having a type 1 EKG than if you are at a lower uh, polygenetic risk score d -sile. So that makes Brugada syndrome for the majority an oligogenic disease with accumulation of many rare variants. This is, of course, very difficult to counsel for, uh, but this is what it is. Uh, the accumulation of many rare variants uh, gives you more likelihood of developing Brugada syndrome. And that can be common variants with a small effect size, and that can also be rare variants with a larger effect size and SCM5A variants may be, be among them or maybe actually very, very large so that by itself they can lead to disease. So in conclusion, as to the genetic part, uh, Bogada syndrome is genetically heterogeneous. SCM5A seems to be responsible in 15 to 30% of patients. For the rest, it's likely oli oligogenic and, it, and that has, I've not mentioned that, but that seems not to have a major impact on prognosis as we have uh, found at least so far no major impact. I'll continue with risk stratification. That is another hot topic in Brugada syndrome. And it's important to realize what the history is here. These are the three papers from the Brugada brothers uh, who started to study this in 1989, and then they extended the cohort uh, in, in 2002 and even more in 2003. And the event rate per year has dropped in their own cohort from 12% per year to 6% per year to around 1% per year. And this is a result of inclusion bias. So in the early days when they described the first 30 patients, it was very clear that these were very high risk patients that are obviously identified first. And then if you extend it with asymptomatic family members or other individuals, then the risk per year drops and can even drop slower to about 1% per year. And that is actually what is found uh, throughout the literature. If you go through the literature, then the, um, that, that doesn't, I don't know why that doesn't show, but all the other studies show a similar event rate around 1% uh, to 1.5% per year. I personally believe it is in the range of 1% per year if you have a spontaneous type 1 EKG. <clears throat> what then determines the risk? Uh, there seems to be some uh, uh, EKG parameters like spontaneous variation, which is a high risk factor, fragmented QS. Genotype does matter, SCN5A is more malignant and seems to be a risk factor. 
uh, other EKG is variables like the HV interval, not an EPS inducibility has always been a big question mark that, that has led to very uh, to many debates with, where I was involved in as well. This is the Heart Rhythm 2011 with the Bugara brothers who really believe in EP testing to predict events in Bugara syndrome. And Dr. Fiskin and myself uh, are a believer that it does not predict cardiac events in Bugara syndrome. This is a study from Dr. Fiskin summarizing the literature as of 2016. And what he did was um, he, he, he looked at all the prognostic tests in Bugara syndrome and um, divided it in tests that show an association with a history of cardiac arrest. And more importantly, and this is where we are interested in, in tests that show an association with arrhythmic events during follow up. And you see there is a lot of heterogeneity here. Uh, not, for example, to mention inducibility of VF. There are two studies who, which are positive. Both studies are from the Bugara brothers, and there are three which are negative. And other, uh, there's not much consistency except for the presence of a spontaneous type 1 EKG that seems to indicate risk. This is when it, it, we are dealing with a drug induced type 1 EKG, uh, then the uh, risk is zero in the in the vast majority of studies. In some, it is a little bit higher. This, this is the highest. This includes ICD patients, so also many um, arrhythmias in the ICD. Uh, but the risk of a drug-induced EKG patient is in the range of 0.5, and I think it's way lower than 0.5% per year. And you may actually wonder whether that is worthwhile screening for. So, then it comes to the score models. Uh, I skipped the ones that were from an older date, and I start here in 2017 with a study of Dr. Bugara from Brussels himself. They developed a, a score model to predict risk of events in patients with Bugara syndrome. And um, this is what they then show. This is on 400 uh, patients, and the risk factors they identified was a spontaneous type 1 EKG, which provided one point. Early familial sudden cardiac death was a point. Inducible EPS, two points. Presence of syncope, two points. This is sinus node disease, uh, three points. And sudden cardiac death was a presenting symptom. So cardiac arrest as a presenting symptom was four points. And then if you add all these points and subdivide your group of patients and patients with zero or one point, patients with two points, whatever the category is they come from, three points, four points, and more than five points, then you can clearly see that it's easy to identify the high-risk group. But that is obvious if you have a spontaneous type 1 and a cardiac arrest, we know you are in the high-risk group. Uh, and it's But in this range, it becomes not so easy, uh, although the authors claim that they have very high uh, discrimination between high and low risk in that, but I think I then, I then refer to the zero and one point uh, and the more than five points. And there was an attempt from the French group in more uh, recent years, uh, this is uh, four years later, from the group in Nantes, who also studied this in a very large cohort of patients. They had over 1,600 patients. But only 461, they had all these variables that were relevant for the previous score from Russell. And then if they, they made a similar plot as the group in Brussels, and the zero point is here, the one to three is here, that's already different from what Bugada showed. The four is here and the five is here, five plus is here. So also in, in this replication so hard, you want to refer to that as such, you can easily identify the very high risk patients, but it's very difficult to identify the moderate or the low risk patients. So that is the issue, uh, and it still is. The problem is not the high risk and the very low risk patients, but in the intermediate group. And from that French study, uh, that refers to over 60% of the patient group. So this has not been solved. There is a very recent paper by the group of Pierre Lambias in uh, Study, uh, published a year ago in the Jack uh, Clinical EP. And they have another um, risk score. This is on a much larger group. 
over 1,100 patients, <clears throat> and they also identified a type 1 EKG, spontaneous type 1 EKG, as a risk factor, syncope as a risk factor. These are established risk factors. And in their uh, hands, the, the, the aspect of the peripheral leads are, is important when there is a type 1 EKG in RPL, for example, that's known to be a risk factor, or when they see early repressation that is known to be a risk factor. And if you add all these points, you get the total risk points and the five-year predicted risk of ventricular arrhythmia sound cardiac death is here at the y-axis. So the more points, the higher the risk. Um, but it's also important to realize that in this lower range, up to 15 points, and that is including the spontaneous type 1, the risk is in that same order, as I mentioned before, around 1% per year. But these other risk factors uh, really seem to contribute. It's important to note that this model has not yet been replicated, so we are waiting um, for that. But this is where we are with risk certification, and I think the most reliable model at this point in time is this one, and not the one from Russell's that I mentioned before. Then a few words on pathogenesis. I will not make this uh, very long because it can be an hour uh, in itself. The discussion has always been from the early days whether Bukhara syndrome is a repolarization disorder or a depolarization disorder. Does it refer to the repolarization of the heart or does it impact on the depolarization of the heart? And you can simplify this into um, is it the channelopathy? Does it alter the electrical uh, parameters of the heart, or is it the cardiomyopathy, does it alter the structural characteristics of the heart? And, and for a lot of evidence that I'm not going to in detail, I'm a firm believer that it's more or less a cardiomyopathy. Bugatti syndrome has always been divided in the subgroup of electrical diseases, but I'm convinced it should be in the subgroup of cardiomyopathy be it a very discrete cardiomyopathy and be it located in the right ventricular outflow tract only in many patients, not in all. Some have more extended uh, aberration in the right ventricle or sometimes even in the left ventricle. But the majority of patients has an exclusive subset in the right ventricular outflow tract epicardia layer. And <clears throat> the reason to think so is that imaging in Brugada syndrome, if you do accurate imaging with MRI, is always abnormal. RVOT is always a little bit wide and the RV is not normal. Imaging of the left ventricle may even be abnormal. And pathology, if you have pathology of a Brugada syndrome patient, it's always abnormal and shows fibrosis. And that the best evidence for that this is more a cardiomyopathy than, uh, than, a, uh, than an electrical disease or more the problem relates more to depolarization, that is conduction of the electrical impulse than repolarization comes from this uh, beautiful study from Dr. Nana Mani in Bangkok, in Thailand. He's an electrophysiologist in Los Angeles, but works nowadays most of the time in Bangkok and Thailand, because he's origin Thai. And he studied a mapping of the right ventricle from the outside. So this is epicardial mapping from the right ventricle. What you see here is the heart. The red here is the aorta. The, the purple is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle, the yellow part. And this is the right ventricle outflow tract. And if you measure signals from this side, you get these fractionated signals. They are very abnormal. Signal, a normal signal from the heart, I'll show you in the next slide, should, um, should look like this. These are normal signals from the heart. They, these are taken from the left ventricle. Here's one from the left ventricle here, 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 and here. Also this one from the bottom of the right ventricle. But the higher you go up in the right ventricular outflow tract, that is where you measure abnormal signals. And if you ablate these abnormal signals, that is what he did in this particular studies in 11 patients, what you ablate is that you normalize uh, the EKG. That is the next slide. This is just to show that this is only present at the outside of the heart. So this is from signals from the outside of the heart. This is in the same heart, but then from the inside, the catheters from the inside, the electrical activity is completely normal. The abnormality is at the outside of the heart. And if you ablate in the area of these signals, this is a patient, the patient before ablation with a clear type one EKG, and then after ablation, the type one EKG is done 
and you have more or less secured, uh, cured the patient uh, from, from the disease. And that is actually what has been shown by anatomania and in the meantime by others as well, that ablation of fractionated epicardial signals in the right ventricular artery tract effectively restores the electrocardiogram that prevent recurrent arrhythmias that has been shown now with follow-up up to 10 years. <clears throat> and at this point, we are there that, that we think it should be offered as second-line therapy. You may ask why not as first-line therapy? That is because this procedure is not without risk and you need to do it in very experienced hands. And even then, sometimes uh, there are significant complications that could lead to death. But in a patient with the, with the clear type one and in a patient with, with significant arrhythmias, you may consider this uh, as, a, as a procedure to perform. So how to deal with these patients? This is the indication for ICD. When there is a patient with a prior cardiac arrest or sustained fatigue, there's a class one recommendation for an ICD. The spontaneous type one EKG and a history of syncope should also be treated with a class as a class 2A with an ICD. The inducibility of VF is still in the guidelines, but as a class 2B, which means that you probably should not do it. And an asymptomatic individual with a drug-induced type 1 EKG should definitely not have an ICD. There are a number of pharmacological options. Isoproteranol is very effective, uh, but is only available as an IV form, and that should then be used in the presence of arrhythmic storms. Quinidine is a drug that is effective in Brugada syndrome and actually normalized the EKG as well. And this is an experimental drug, Silostazol, which also seems to be effective in the Brugada syndrome. So in conclusion for Brugada syndrome, this is my last slide. The Brugada syndrome has very complex genetics with only 30% SCN5A, and that's a maximum number, I believe. And the, the rest, the remainder is explained by uh, more variants with, uh, <coughs> with uh, less penetrants, and that is then it, for counseling, it is complex. Risk stratification, as I've shown, is not so well defined, although maybe the last study that I showed is something to, uh, to uh, consider. Uh, there are promising therapeutic options, and I'm now referring to the uh, ablation of the right ventricular artery tract, epicardial myocardium to right ventricular artery tract. I think we first, we first have to prove that that is infected indeed in lower risk of patients as well. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. So we actually do have a couple of questions already. Um, so the audience was really engaged um, as we were going along. So one question that we got was, um, is the Shanghai score valid for children? Um, I think it is. We have not studied it in particular for children, but I don't see a good reason why it shouldn't be. The, in children, the same elements are relevant for the diagnosis than in the, um, in the adult population. Oops, I put myself back on mute. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so a second question that we got was, um, is there a chance that the seven genotype negative phenotype positive individuals from the study could be false negatives for SCN5A? Is there a high level of confidence in the testing process and sample chain of custody? Yeah, so in the, these were families with an established variant in SCN5A. Uh, so for that particular variant that is present in the family, we tested and we tested, of course, the rest of the gene also, and, and nothing was found there. So I don't think there is a, <clears throat> the, the chance is very high that you miss something in SCN5A. The reviewers at the time made a comment, could that this be some of the other genes uh, involved? And, and But I've shown you that the other genes are probably not that relevant, okay, but then it should be an aggregate of of um, of, of the, the very several rare variants, uh, but that then is the essence of of the genetics of Brugada syndrome. This was in 2008. I've seen over the 12 years that followed to 15 years now, 
<clears throat> I've seen many, many more of these families. So this is a real thing. And I don't think we are simply missing the causal variant in the family here. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, another question that we got was, what are your thoughts on the effect of vigorous exercise um, and the effect on um, patients? Yeah, I think in principle, exercise is not a problem for Bulgaria syndrome patients, but vigorous exercise may point to the fact that when, when you do exercise at the level that body temperature starts to rise, uh, then it may be an issue. And body temperature, of course, may also rise if you exercise uh, when it's hot outside. So you have to be a little bit careful there. So vigorous exercise, running a marathon in, in um, uh, what I, I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, but 30 degrees Celsius in our uh, part of the world is probably not a good idea. And someone um, also asked, what about um, things like going into a sauna? Um, yeah. which has also been shown to have cardiovascular benefit. It sounds like that's also probably not indicated. Yeah, it's the same thing. If it is, if it's the hot part, that's fine. The cold part is the, when you, you, you jump in the cool to cold water afterwards, that's not a problem. But the hot part, I, I think you can do it for a short time, but not too long, because as soon as body temperature starts to rise, Brugada syndrome is an issue. Perfect. Another question we got was, what is the effect of epicardial ablation on sinus node disease? Uh, it does not impact on sinus node disease. So what you do here is you ablate the abnormal signals in the myocardium of the right ventricular artery tract. You are not touching the sinus node. You are not in the neighborhood of the sinus node. So it does not affect the sinus node. I personally believe that sinus node disease is only pertinent in patients with an SCN 5A variant. That is actually one of the critics that I have on that study from Russell with the risk gratification because that the, in the sinus node disease, as you may have noticed, contributes significantly to the risk score with the three points. But in the population, there were only a few children who had sinus node disease, and all these children had a SCN5A variant. So I don't think that element is, is independent from having an SCN5A variant. Uh, but you're not touching it with the right ventricular alpha tract ablation. Thank you. Um, and another question, we have so many questions. Um, so, um, one is, what is the, what is your opinion on gene therapy as a potential therapeutic option for Brugada syndrome? That is a difficult question. You, um, so that, that should be then something with, with the sodium channel. The problem with the sodium channel is that it's not, not SCN5A is referred to as the cardiac specific sodium channel, but it's also found in the gastrointestinal system everywhere. It's, it's in the brain. So modifying SCN5A is, is probably not so easy. And, and you, you also have to modify it only in the right ventricular artery tract. I haven't shown you data on the presence of fibrosis in the right ventricular artery tract protract because that underlies the, the, the fractionated activity. And I don't think you're going to cure that with uh, gene therapy. If the fibrosis is there, it will be there forever, whatever you do. Um, and, and so I don't, I'm, I'm not that convinced that gene therapy is, is a way to go for, for this, this particular disease. Great answer. Um, so another question that we got was, many genetic testing labs continue to offer larger gene panels for Brugada syndrome. Will data from these other genes help to determine their role, or should clinicians be suggesting that labs change their Brugada syndrome testing to uh, only SCN5A? Well, that's what I would do. Uh, and you can refer to the latest consensus document, which I hope will lead to stopping the policy, the bigger, the better panels. That's not, that's simply not true for Bulgada syndrome. SCN5A is the causal gene and the other genes are uh, disputed uh, at best uh, for Bulgada syndrome. It also leads to trouble. I've practiced in New York for, for several months and I've seen many cases uh, with a potential Brugada EKG and then a variant in one of these other disputed genes. And that 
that upsets people and that, up, that makes doctors nervous, that makes uh, patients nervous because they have some something genetically that is abnormal. I, I simply think you should not test for it. And with this consensus document, we made a very clear statement and we put it with a red heart, that is the code in this consensus document for not doing it. So I think the, uh, you should stop it. Um, that also holds for Embry, by the way, but also for other um, uh, gene uh, genotyping companies. Okay, and for, for research, that's a different question. So if you want to, to continue with for research, that's fine. But then that research is not done in every center in the US ordering a genetic test. That's helpful. Do you think that it should be combined with like a long QT or sh short QT phenotype, or do you think it should be only Brugada by itself? Yeah, that's what I believe, because if you combine it with long QT phenotype, then you add the, the genes that, that I think you should be off the list for Brugada syndrome. And some of them are in the long QT panel, and they should simply mm -hmm. not be tested in a Brugada syndrome patient. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, another question that we get is in Canada, drug companies have stopped making quinidine um, and harder and harder to get. Do you see this as a problem in other countries? Yeah, that's a definite problem. That's also a problem in European countries. Um, and sometimes it's, it's stopped, uh, the, the production is stopped for a while. And we have had serious issues with that. Patients who were stable on quinidine had to stop it for a while and then do get defibrillator shocks. So the, the availability of quinidine is an issue. It's not only quinidine, by the way, in the, the broader sense, in the arrhythmia field, there are other antiarrhythmic drugs that are have limited availability. So that is a true issue, and I don't know how to solve it. Another question was, are there recommendations for cardiac imaging when trying to differentiate between Brugada and its phenocopy? Yeah, so the, we make an MRI in every patient uh, at first, uh, when we first meet the patient, the, the, then if they do get an ICD, then making MRIs becomes a little bit troublesome. I know it's, it's possible with the current generation of ICDs, but there's always <clears throat> difficulties with interpretation if somebody has an ICD. But an MRI is, is useful, particularly when you see uh, much more damage on the right ventricle, then obviously you should consider ARVC in your uh, differential diagnosis. Um, and and that, that's why you think you need an MRI. But, but some abnormalities on the MRI, like um, some widening of the right ventricular heart tract, some fibrosis even might also be is compatible with Brugada syndrome. But if you see really aneurysms in the right ventricular wall, I would consider more ARVC. That's helpful. And a follow-up question from someone else was, is there utility for CVA versus MRI? And what is CVA? They have not. I don't know what CVA is. I'm not sure. Um, Let's see if they if they respond. If the person who asked the question can add that, we'll come back to that question. Yeah. Um, uh, so this was a situational question. Uh, there's a patient who's seven year old female with paroxysomal AV block up to 29 seconds and spontaneous type one pattern with clear Brugada syndrome in the father and type one pattern in the siblings. The proband is the only one to have syncope. She's now fine after a pacemaker implantation. No VT shown on ILR, no inducibility on EP, no SCN 5A mutation. Is this kind of AV block something you see often? The ILR that demonstrated it did not show any atrial activity. Yeah, so um, atrial standstill is something that is very common in the setting of Brugada syndrome. <clears throat> but, but particularly, and I'm hesitating why I should say only, why do I should say only, but certainly particular in patients with SCN5A, loss of function SCN5A variants. So in a case like this, I would go back to the genotyping company and really check about the status as it has every possibility being ruled out with SCN5A involvement, because it's very typical for SCN5A involvement. And that then would also explain the AV block because that also goes with SCN5A involvement. Okay. 
Um, someone asked, would you recommend to family members of a patient with a Shanghai score of two, so they're asymptomatic, but positive a uh, Agmaline test, I, I butchered that, I apologize, to undergo um, Agmaline test, considering they are not definitive Brugada syndrome according to the score? Yeah, so we have become very conservative with Agmaline testing now in the patient with a type 2 EKG or type 3 EKG without further symptoms or without family history. We are, we are not pursuing with an Ashmaline test. Um, there's also another reason for that, and that is, that is that the Ashmaline test has a pretty high false positive rate, I believe. Uh, there are studies that in patients with simple AV nodal reentent tachycardia, almost 30% of these patients will, do have a positive Ashmaline test in patients with myotonal dystrophia or ARBC or WPW syndrome, it's almost 20%. So the specificity of the Ashmaline test is really questioned. And, and, and these numbers either mean that 30% that of AV nodal reentry patients or 20% of ARBC patients have Brugada syndrome, or the test is not specific enough. So we have been, become very conservative with that. And, and it also means, and it's important to stress that if you have just the drug-induced EKG, we are actually not proceeding anymore with genetic testing in all of these individuals because you're never going to find something in SCM5A. And, and as, we, as I mentioned, we have stopped with testing the other genes for several years now. You're not going to find something. Okay. Um, and apparently they meant CT versus MRI. Okay. Um. Yeah, yeah, CT is something that you can use as well. Um, you do sometimes see it, yeah, CT is possible to, to judge the, uh, the uh, uh, contraction of the right ventricle as well. So CT is an option if an MRI is not possible. Okay, wow. So we made it through a lot of the questions. Um, there's so many, this audience was very engaged. Um, but I'm going to, so I think we've reached a good kind of stopping point, unless there's anything else that these questions brought up that you would like to address, um, because there were a lot of them. Um, yeah, so I, I may just then repeat what I said, that because that are the most important differences from the past. Mm -hmm. I think we should stop with testing on a large scale, so the larger panels should, should not be <clears throat> offered anymore. Uh, and I also believe that the uh, value of a drug-induced uh, type 1 EKG is overestimated. And with the Shanghai criteria, we actually uh, do not diagnose these patients anymore as Brugada syndrome. Uh, this might change. I realize this might change in the, in the future because it, it could be that uh, some of these patients still have Brugada syndrome, but I, I believe a significant number of them do not have it because the specificity of the Ashmaline test is not uh, not that good. And the final thing is that the um, that's what you see in Europe at the moment, there are a few centers that are offering the ablation therapy for patients with a drug-induced EKG. And I, I also believe that's simply wrong to do that at the moment. These patients are at very low risk. It's not even sure they have a substrate. Um, and if they have a substrate, they are at, at very low risk and they should not be exposed to uh, procedures with a, with a significant risk for uh, for uh, complications. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, this was so incredibly helpful. Um, I'm really happy that we had this webinar because I get a lot of questions about Brugada syndrome just in my role here. So um, I think this hopefully answered a lot of the questions that people have about Brugada. Um, and then if anyone has any other questions, you can email our Ambry um, email that we have, um, and we can pass that along, um, and then you'll be able to answer those later, hopefully. Yes, I will, yes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was excellent. Um, so please join us for our next conference, which is a review of CDH1 with Dr. Rashid Karam. Um, and we look forward to um, hearing from everyone. Um, and thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. and. Great rest of your week. Bye. Bye-bye.